Hey everyone, I'm Ian McCarthy of Lifting for Life and No Bullshit Bodybuilding, bringing you another training vlog today featuring a different combination of elements. We have the music, as we've used in some vlogs, and the informative text, and as you may have noticed, I'm talking to you, so that would be a voiceover. So hopefully we'll strike the right balance for those of you who, uh, many of you have asked for voiceovers, you've said that you prefer these. And then others have said that you really like the videos that don't have voiceovers, you like the music and you like the text. So I don't feel I have much bias toward any of these in particular. My interest is just in giving you the best content possible. So please do continue to let me know what you think in the comment section below. So what we're looking at now is upper body session I did two or three nights ago. The date was here. I don't remember what it was, but I vividly remember the workout because I was incredibly tired the entire session, but I just pushed through it really out of principle, like refusing to stop. And interestingly, I was able to do a lot more than I thought. I made progress on almost every exercise and I got to everything I wanted to get to. So I think that speaks to the fact that sometimes you really just need to work through fatigue. Interestingly though, in hindsight, I realized that the following day I was absolutely dead, so maybe I would have actually been better off pulling back, whether that be in terms of exercises done, sets per exercise, load, it's hard to say. So my recommendation is to always use your own best judgment and recognize that even in using your own best judgment, you're going to make mistakes and then you just have to adjust to how things play out. So what I've done in the intervening period is it's become evident that I'm uh, very overreached at this point. So I've pulled back pretty hard, added more food and sleep. And I'm likely going to really push myself to actually take a rest day tomorrow and then um, I'll be running a new program. Things will be very similar overall, but I'll be including less heavy work than I've been doing recently. For those of you who don't know, I've had two heavy full body days a week for the past six weeks or so. It was really an experiment to see how things played out because if I'm honest with myself and with you, I, I would say that I have a bias against heavy lifting in the sense that it's never that I can recall worked well for me in terms of generating good progress. And it's always been disproportionately fatiguing for me. And um, after a quite extensive discussion with Eric Helms on Facebook, I, I was willing to take another look at it in terms of trying it out. And I'm, I realized that I'm having, the, well, I was going to say having this discussion with you. I realized that I'm recording this voiceover in the context of, you know, feeling very overreached right now. And that's going to skew my judgment. But if anything, I might say that my opinion is more negative than it was in that I'm quite willing to... A grant that there is plausibly a benefit to heavy training in the context of hypertrophy, but it is it, it is very disproportionately fatiguing in the sense that on a per set basis, heavy training will fatigue you more. And in terms of hypertrophic response relative to fatigue, you're getting more fatigue. Uh, if you're comparing heavy training to moderately heavy training, let's say, you know, doing sets of 8, doing sets of 10 or 12, or even light training. So, I don't regret the experiment of doing the heavy training in this period. But again, I have come out of it, you know, feeling very burnt out. And if anything, I think my volume ended up lower than it could have been. I think I could have done a lot more work with lighter training. So, with my next program that... I already have a really good sense of what it's going to look like. I want to finish it off. Um, and the, for those of you who have been following me on Instagram, I've been that's where I've been talking about this the most. But I'm working on a project called the, you know, the working title is the Lifting for Life Hypertrophy Program. But as I'm working on it, it's becoming way more expansive. It's looking like it's going to turn into a book on how to train for muscle gain. And I'm going to run, you know, an initial version, a, a sketch of a general idea of what the program is going to look like, see how things play out for me, see if I'm better able to recover than I've been able to over the past few weeks, because I've realized that a huge, huge part of making the program, making the 
project the best it can be is ensuring that people are able to recover. You know, I want people to make really good progress, but I don't want them to feel like shit. And it, it's more than even I don't want people to, people to feel bad. I mean, e even if we come at it from an extremely pragmatic perspective of you want to make good progress, well, if you're extremely burned out, the result is that you're doing less work. You're generating less of a stimulus for hypertrophy. So that's where I am. Interestingly, I didn't expect to talk for five minutes about this, but it uh, seems like I wanted to. So that's the context surrounding this workout. So as you can see, I've done some, I did pull-ups, a flat dumbbell press, uh, some dumbbell rows, haven't done those in a while. And the reason why I did the, the flat dumbbell press I was planning on doing, the dumbbell rows I included really, because mentally I was, wasn't really present for this workout. So I wanted to switch things up a little bit so I could engage a little more. So again, dumbbell rows. And then maybe half or two-thirds of the way through the workout, I got a little a little bit of a second wind. I say that I didn't really have a first wind, but um, I added a little more at the tail end that I, than I expected I would be able to do. But I did a lot of single sets uh, because I just my overwhelming sense was I could do one good set on a lot of these movements and not two good sets. So my preference would be to do more exercises, uh, one good set on each exercise, and prevent myself from, excuse me, uh, performing a bunch of junk volume, you know, maybe going through the motions, but um, doing a, generating a lot less hypertrophy on a per set basis because you're just not engaged and you're too fatigued to do what you want to do. This is a, as the text said, this is a single arm uh, cable lateral raise. Haven't done these for a long time. They felt really good. Wanted to do a little more for my side delts, which have always been a weak point. I'm definitely not structurally advantaged when it comes to shoulders. Um, so always, always, always working to improve my delts. Some rope pushdowns here. And <clears throat> for those of you who ask this question, and not just people asking me, I mean, this is a question that comes up in the evidence-based community frequently the question of, you know, do we count bench press, do we count shoulder press, etc. toward triceps volume? I would say so. I certainly understand the perspective of saying, hey, look, if you're absolutely smashing your triceps with a heavy dumbbell overhead extension, that's probably more significant than a flat dumbbell press or something like this. Interestingly, to my knowledge, that that's not a view which has ever been investigated in the literature. I would say it's an on the basis of my experience, it's anecdotally plausible. Uh, but at the same time, you know, to use an example, there there's footage, I think I included this in my first vlog actually, of me doing some incline barbell pressing, and you can tell that my triceps are highly engaged. And so what I've always, well, I, I haven't always said this actually, uh, even maybe two or three years ago and further back, I probably would have not held to this view, but. I think that was just a function of ignorance at that point, honestly. Um, at this point, I would say that if you're performing, you know, loaded elbow extension through a full range of motion or something close to a full range of motion, it's really hard to argue for the position of, hey, that doesn't count as triceps volume. Now with the biceps, I think it's different because oftentimes you're performing uh, pulling movements with your forearm. Uh, pronated or in a neutral position and your biceps are in a weaker position in that case so they're going to contribute less so uh, I actually wouldn't count something like a pull up toward biceps volume whereas underhand pull down or a chin up I would because the forearm is supinated the biceps are in a stronger position that are going to contribute more and I think anecdotally that holds up because I mean, you can do pull ups you don't feel them in your biceps you do chin ups or an underhand pull down um, at the very least, you'll feel them more. That's my experience. That's the, that's the experience of others I've talked to. And I, interestingly, though, I think it's worth noting that, and this gets into into what's called force sharing, and I'm so far away from being an expert on, on biomechanics, but uh, my understanding from those who know a lot more about this that I've talked to is to some extent you are able to manipulate force sharing consciously so perhaps if you really think about using your biceps on an underhand pull down the biceps will actually do more of the work uh, relative to your lats and other shoulder extensors so I find that a fascinating area of of study um, 
I'll definitely go, yeah, I, I need to, I need to go to school to study that in particular so I can understand that. This is a, this is a biceps curl. Oh, I apologize, by the way, for the, uh, some of these bad angles. I don't know what was going on. Like, normally I'm actually good at framing like this, but didn't work. It was the fatigue. It's not my fault. I didn't mean anything by it. I like you guys. So I step out quite a bit to alter the tension curve to, to, this is a very technical explanation. It makes it more dissimilar to something like a barbell curl. And you'll notice that my shoulder is hyperextended here. So that's going to lengthen the biceps at the shoulder joint since they, interestingly, Andrew Vygotsky, in a discussion I had with him, gosh, this was about two years ago, he's actually been able to look at cadavers and, and if I recall correctly, he said that it looks like both heads of the biceps cross the shoulder, not just one of the two heads. For the, for the one person out there who is interested in that, and that one person is me. All right, so finished off the workout with four sets of 15 of cable crunches, as my abs are definitely something I've wanted to focus on a lot over the past year or so. I probably neglected them a bit previously. My abs and arms. I neglected quite a bit. Four sets of 15, focusing on lumbar flexion. All right, guys, so we're coming toward the end of the video. Thank you so much for listening. I realize a lot of this wasn't directly relevant to the video, but I hope it was at least uh, valuable to you in, in some other sense, provided you with some informative uh, information. So if you like the video, please do hit the like button. Please do comment below. Really appreciate you watching and listening. I know I don't have the sexiest voice, but uh, I, have a, I have a good brain. I consult myself frequently, and I will see you again soon.